Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is February 12th of 2021, and I'm going to be discussing this new, not quite yet peer-reviewed article from the Recovery Trial Collaborative Group titled Tosiluzumab for COVID-19, or it might be called Tosiluzumab in patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19, and in parentheses, recovery, preliminary results of a randomized control open label platform trial. I definitely have to tip my hat to the to these people who are part of this recovery collaborative group because they're the ones who came out with the data showing that dexamethasone does help save lives in patients with COVID-19, which to, to be honest is one of the only treatments that we know actually works for this for this awful, awful virus. As always, I have to give the disclaimer that you should read this article for yourself and not trust me. It's free for you to download. Just check it out in the show notes that's underneath this podcast or if you're watching this on YouTube in the description box below. But read it there. Don't trust me. Let's get started. I hate the fact that this pandemic has already been going on for a year. You know, it seems like we've been having our ups and downs and hopefully with the vaccination the downs will continue going downward and we can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. But for the time being, I don't know about what your ICU is looking like, but my ICU still has quite a few COVID patients who I'd like to save. Thank you very much. It's no secret anymore that the vast majority of people do extremely well with COVID, but there's a small portion of the population who get extremely sick and we can't quite identify who's going to get sick and who doesn't get sick, even though we know that there are risk factors that lead to worse disease, such as obesity, advanced age, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. What we have learned is that COVID in certain people causes all the systemic infl- inflammation. And so this is what actually causes the problem in, in, in the majority of these patients who get sick. And we've heard about this cytokine storm of sorts where For those people who have these fancy lab tests, you can actually measure your interleukin-1, your interleukin-6, tuber necrosis factor, alpha, and see that they're through the roof. For those of us who work in other institutions where we do not have the funds to send off these specific pro-inflammatory cytokines, instead, you know, we check the D-dimers, ferritin, and C-reactive protein, watch these things, these markers go through the roof and watch our patients get sicker despite our best efforts. Like I said before, we know dexamethasone works and there have been other treatments out there, which I'm not going to discuss here, which may or may not have some value in treating these unfortunate patients. Since the beginning of this whole pandemic, a lot of people, including myself, have tried different things to see if it works. And one of these treatments is tocilizumab. If you've been following along on my Instagram, my webpage, or this podcast, you recall, you'll recall likely recall that at the beginning of this pandemic, I made a podcast about tocilizumab and how it does not work. So if you go back to that podcast, you actually see that it was a pharmaceutical company, Roche Pharmaceuticals, who, based on their own trial called the Covacta trial, they said that tocilizumab should not be used anymore outside of a randomized control trial. And so here is a randomized control trial, which is the recovery trial. Let's get started, or better yet, let's let's just... To those of you who are unfamiliar with what tocilizumab is, it's basically an anti-IL-6 receptor monoclonal antibody. And so what it does is it inhibits the binding of IL-6 to both the membrane and soluble IL-6 receptors. What this does, and again, I'm reading this from the article, is it blocks IL-6 signaling and reduces inflammation. Many people, especially in the rheumatology world, are used to seeing tocilizumab in patients who have rheumatoid arthritis and there are other diseases of sorts that we don't see very often in the ICU where this is used. During the course of this pandemic, there have been numerous, and I'm talking about numerous trials looking at tocilizumab, and honestly, they're all over the place. Trying to find the exact patient population that this will benefit has always been quite challenging, and therefore, this is what the recovery trial is trying to address. Again, I have to tip my hat to the authors and the researchers who put together this trial, all the all the teams, I guess, in the NHS, which is the National Health Service in the UK, Good job for good job to all these people. I mean, I know I didn't do any of this research, so I definitely have to be very, uh, very grateful for them. 
if you want to get into how they randomized that masked all these patients, it's quite fascinating because they had several simultaneous trials going on, including looking at dexamethasone, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something that if you really want to nerd out looking at this trial, definitely check that out. But what they did find is that the patients who were eligible to get randomized to tocilizumab either got the usual standard of care or standard care plus tocilizumab, and it was in a one-to-one. -one. So one of the questions on how much tocilizumab people got on in different trials, it, it gets a little bit murky here, but what they do specify is that they gave a dose of tocilizumab based on the person's body weight. And this is where you have to start thinking about the cost of all of this, okay? And I'm going to just kind of explain how it should work and my thoughts on it to a certain degree. Because that's what you came here for, basically, to see what my thoughts are, I guess, maybe. So, okay. But here's the deal. Tocilizumab is not a cheap medication. The average wholesale price is basically $138 per milliliter per up-to-date when I just checked it prior to recording this podcast. Excuse me, if a patient weighed more than 90 kilograms, they got 800 milligrams of tocilizumab. So what that means is that the, a patient who weighed more than 90 kilograms, they got 800 milligrams. If you convert that into mLs, that is 20 milligrams per mL, and then you do the fuzzy math of 138 bucks per cc. Anyway, long story short is that it's about $5,500 per dose of this medication for the patients. So you might say to yourself, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty expensive for these patients who are over 90 kilograms. And obviously, it's going to be less for people who weigh less than 90 kilograms. And again, the, the dosages are all in the article. But when you come to think about it, if this could end up saving some people's lives, and we'll talk about the number needed to treat and all that later on as we get to it. If you think about the fact that we're giving people so much uh, of this other drug, the remdesivir, that costs $3,120, and that one, at least in my opinion, or at least it hasn't shown to save any lives in any of the trials, then, then maybe this might be beneficial to give instead of remdesivir. But I, I digress. Uh, one of the other things that was done is that a second dose could be given 12 to 24 hours later if the doctor felt it was necessary to do so. I always encourage people to read the baseline characteristics of the people who were enrolled into the study. Like that you get an idea of the different age ranges and how they stratified those, the sex, which here was predominantly male, about two-thirds to one-third female. We were obviously in the UK, so their ethnicity is predominantly white. And one of the things I always like to focus on is the number of days since symptom onset until they gave the drugs. And in this case, in the tocilizumab group, it was nine days versus the usual care was 10 days. This is not statistically significant, but it's important to note that they were waiting for the cytokine storm to actually go up on these patients. Also important to note that 46 and 45% respectively were not on any type of ventilator support at the time of randomization. 41% in both groups were on non-invasive ventilation, which is either CPAP or BiPAP, and 13%, 13 to 14% were. Oh yeah, I can't, I can't believe I forgot to say this. They had a huge number of patients in this trial with 2,022 patients in the tocilizumab group versus 2,094 in the usual care group. But other things that I like to look at in my patients who I'm treating with with COVID are their different inflammatory markers. And the, the average C-reactive protein, for example, was 14.3, and the ferritin was around 940-something. So, you know, these patients had elevated inflammatory markers. Again, these patients were sick with diabetes, heart disease, etc., and one of the other things that's interesting to see is that 82% of the patients in both groups were already on systemic corticosteroids, which is something that we already have our patients who are somewhat oxygen dependent on already. So let's look at the outcomes here. And this is table two for those of you who are following along, page 30 on this, uh, this pre-printed draft. And what they found was that the primary outcome, which was total 28-day mortality, they found that 29% of patients in the tocilizumab group died versus 33% in the usual care group. And this is statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.006. And the rate ratio is 0 0.86. And the confidence interval looks pretty. 
So whenever you get a good clear percentage for an outcome like this, in this case, the 28 day mortality outcome, I always recommend that you go ahead and you calculate the number needed to treat. And so what this means is that you would need to treat 25 patients so that one person doesn't die. So it depends on how you want to weigh this. Obviously, we want to save as many lives as possible. But at the same time, you have to keep in mind that this is not going to work for everybody. Okay, definitely not going to work for everybody. In addition to that, there was also a difference in the mean time to being discharged alive. So the people who received tocilizumab were discharged far earlier than the patients who got usual care. Now we could use our trusty number needed to treat to look at the amount of people discharged alive from the hospital within 28 days. We're in the tocilizumab group, 54% were discharged alive within 28 days versus 47 in the usual care group. And here we have a number needed to treat of just 14.3, which is definitely more favorable than the 25. When you look at figure three, where you look at the effect of allocation to tocilizumab on 28 day mortality by baseline characteristics, you see that, for example, you're not able to tease anything out of the ages when they go ahead and they stratify people between less than 70 years old, 70 to 80 or greater than 80. You are able to see that in men, there is a better effect than in females, as females, the confidence interval crosses the number one for the rate ratio. In addition to that, with regards to the ethnicity, it seems that the people who are white did better with the tocilizumab than did the patients who were of other ethnicities. And one of the things that I found quite interesting here, even though it's kind of tricky when you look at it, to be honest with you, is the days since symptom onset. The people who received the drug at less than or equal to seven days did better than the patients who got it more than seven days after symptom onset. Either way, there was a trend towards tocilizumab being better. However, the people who got it within, within, with less than or equal to seven days are the ones who did clearly better. And here, and again, and I say this because we are all now using cortical steroids on our COVID patients in the hospital because obviously they're on oxygen. But here you could tease out that the number needed to treat to save a life is just 16.7. It's not 25 like it was before, because again, we're all using cortical steroids on our patients. So the reality is that we need to use we need to use tocilizumab in 16.7 patients in order to save one life. And I think that's pretty good, especially when, I mean, honestly, we don't have anything else that we could give to these patients to save their lives. Looking at other outcomes that are statistically significant, in order to avoid mechanical ventilation, the number needed to treat here was 33.3. Then when it comes to looking at patients who are on certain respiratory support at the time of randomization, um, there was no clear-cut statistical significance on any of these, but there was a trend that the people who were not on ventilator support or on non-invasive ventilation did better than the people who were on the vent. The people who were on the vent really didn't benefit much from this drug. But the thing that was most impressive here, at least in my opinion, was that the people who received cortical steroids, these, pa these patients did far, far better than the patients who did not use cortical. Okay, so now I have to kind of come clean with you guys about tocilizumab because before I said that, I didn't want to use it anymore. And again, that was supported by the actual pharmaceutical company that creates tocilizumab because they said after the Covacta trial that you should not be using tocilizumab. Let's, let me talk a little bit about my clinical experience with tocilizumab because this has, uh, this has kind of left me a little bit uneasy from the get-go. And these data kind of help support that. So when, when COVID first started coming around and we started seeing these patients who were incredibly ill and on the blogs and, you know, non-evidence-based medicine was saying, hey, give tocilizumab a try, we were using it at my institution. Um, there was a particular patient who I took care of who was really going downhill quickly. I mean, he was getting sick, 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 fast, fast, fast. And I had a conversation with him and also with his son about the fact that I was going to try this experimental therapy on him that had no evidence to support it whatsoever. And he went ahead and gave me the green light to go ahead and administer the drug. Lo and behold, the guy got better. I mean, he said he felt immediately better soon after receiving the, the therapy. So at that point, I 
was completely bullish on giving patients tocilizumab, and I thought it was the greatest thing in the world, and I thought it was going to be the thing that helped us beat COVID. As more important, more and more patients received the drug from me as well as from my colleagues, we saw that it wasn't as efficacious as we once thought. And I guess part of it was erroneously that we were thinking that this was going to be the magic cure to it. But with any trial, even including, for example, the dexamethasone trial, the number needed to treat still means that despite having this therapy, people are still going to die, guys. And that's the part that kind of disheartened me because I felt that we were potentially causing harm in patients because after they got the tocilizumab, they got secondary infections, which is something that's not uh, described, at least that I saw to a great deal in this particular trial. Again, you're knocking out the patient's immune system, so you're making it susceptible to secondary infections. But here's the deal. In the patients who are getting corticosteroids, they're also getting prone to secondary infections. I mean, I'm extremely disheartened of all the pseudomonal staff as well as candida infections that I'm seeing in my patients with COVID who have been here for a prolonged period of time. And I know I'm not the only one, so I don't feel bad about that because it's, it's basically littered all over the literature that um, secondary infections are something that's just going to occur from people being in the ICU for so long. So moving forward, I feel that I am going to be administering more tocilizumab to my patients who are critically ill. Anything in the effort to go ahead and decrease the amount of patients who die from this awful virus as long as uh, until, you know, the vaccine comes along and fixes the problems that uh, just fixes all these, these, um, God, I can't, I can't get my mind right right now, but fixes uh, this pandemic and gets us back on the right foot so we can have a sense of normalcy in these li in this life. Again, thank you all very much for your support. Hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Um, share with your friends, like, comment, subscribe if you're on Instagram. Leave me a five-star review if you're on a podcast service of some sort. Greatly appreciate your help. Thanks a lot, guys. Hope you have a great day. Oh, yeah, and read the article for yourself and don't trust me. Bye.